25 and at 825 for more news and weather updates. Until then, stay with us. Good Morning America is up next. Partly sunny today with a high around 60. I have had the same that? position on abortion in favor of a woman's right to choose. Do you support a woman's Do right you, to you choose? Do you support or not? a 24-hour waiting period to have reflection? Talk you're still about avoiding, avoiding the question. question. A rough and tumble debate in Atlanta among the men who would be vice president. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joan London. And I'm Charles Gibson. It is Wednesday, October 14th. The television this morning will be a little calmer. Yes. I mean, how do you describe last night's uh, presidential or vice presidential debate? It was, uh, I think at once, it was riveting. It was funny. Sometimes it was even painful to watch. Who won? Everybody always asks that question. Uh, the candidates obviously think they won. But this morning, we're going to let the candidates themselves answer it. All three of the gentlemen who participated in last night's debate will be joining us this morning. And on this program... Since they will appear at different times, they will not be able to, inter uh, to interrupt each other. <laughs> Vice President Dan Quayle will be here in our first half hour. Senator Al Gore at 7.30. And James Stockdale, Ross Perot's running mate in Are you our, done yet? You know, <laughs> in our uh, 8 o'clock half hour. <laughs> Give this guy a chance. Take a Spencer, go. Go, Spencer, quickly. Okay. Spencer say good, hearing aid say goodbye right. to summer and hello to winter. If you live in the northern Rockies and Plains, snow and cold temperatures arrived yesterday. And today, we'll continue wintry from Montana to Minnesota with snow and cold weather. All right. It, 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 was, it was interesting to watch because it was, you know, painful at times, as you say. And yet, it was much livelier than the presidential debate. Contentious oh. lot. Contentious well, lot. The format layer. allowed for that. This format allowed well, for direct confrontation. That's true. It was a different They're also Actually, debating the format. I think the big winner last night was uh, Al Bruno. <laughs> Al Bruno. Al Bruno. Did you say, Did I say Al? Al? No, you said Al. Who deserved, Silent H. <laughs> who deserved combat pay for last night. Absolutely. And of he course, right now... He H last night. <laughs> That's probably why he got rid of it. <laughs> and of course, right now, leading the news at this hour, guess what more about last night's debate? Mike Schneider has that story. The other news of the day, Mike? Uh, I was feeling like a spectator at a ping pong match for a moment. <laughs> You had to be there. Good morning, everybody. There was an awful lot of winners out there this morning, it seems. Dan Quayle supporters going around saying that he won last night's vice presidential debate by blasting holes into Bill Clinton's credibility. Al Gore backers insist that he won by looking and sounding an awful lot more presidential than Mr. Quayle. And Ross Perot's people say James Stockdale won by saying the right things at the right time. Here's ABC's Ann Compton. The debate started with two of the three candidates in overdrive, almost like Energizer bunnies going on and on and on. Sometimes it was hard to hear over the din. I'll be happy to answer the question. Was your qualification? I'll be happy. I'll be happy. happy to I, I want to go back and make a point. Well, you've asked me a question. Let me, if you want to answer my question, I, question, I will answer question. yours. I made a statement. I hope America is listening very closely to this debate tonight. And I and think America is seeing right now the reason this re uh, nation is in gridlock. That third voice belonged to James Stockdale. Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> Stockdale is Ross Perot's running mate, a former Vietnam POW and non-politician who often simply watched from the sidelines. Vice President Quayle struck over and over again, trying to raise doubts about the top of the Democratic ticket. Bill Clinton has trouble telling the truth. You don't know what you're doing? You're pulling a Clinton. And you know what a Clinton is? And you know what a Clinton is? A Clinton is, is what he says, one, he says one thing one day and another thing the next day. Clinton running mate Albert Gore appeared in tight control, asking pointed questions about George Bush. George Bush is concentrated on every other country in the world. When are you guys going to start worrying about our people here in the United States of America and get our country moving again? The dust-ups produced more heat than light on issues such as mandatory family leave. Your proposal excluded small business. That's the, that's the problem. Now, let me talk about health care. Did, did you require it? Did you require it? My turn. Did you require it? Lighten up, Al. My turn. It's a free discussion. Take a breath, Al. Inhale. Perhaps it was appropriate that that debate took place here in a college theater because it was pure political theater. The debate format encouraged the mixing up of, uh, between the different candidates. It encouraged the free flow of a lot of facts and figures, which kept fact-checkers working all night long. 
And Mike, the, the results of last night will certainly have an impact, perhaps driving the two major party top of the ticket candidates into higher energy levels when they meet in Richmond tomorrow. Mike? And we've heard from uh, some people who watched it, though, that in many cases, Quayle seemed to be too combative. Uh, Gore seemed to be too programmed, and Admiral Stockdale appeared to be uh, just not in his element. What are the spin doctors saying this morning about the various candidates, though? Well, I, I, I have a per personal preference to not listen to any of the spin doctors because they'll always tell you that their guy won. I think a number of people on both sides expressed a little bit of surprise that Dan Quayle made such effective attacks on Bill Clinton. This is something that dates back to earlier in the year in the Murphy Brown situation when President Bush couldn't get attention for family values. Dan Quayle used a club on Murphy Brown and got the issue to the front. And I think he may have done that uh, last night in terms of Bill Clinton not telling the truth and Bill Clinton uh, on a character issue. Uh, Al Gore, I think, drove home some of the more technical points on President Bush's record, both of them feeling very good today as they head off to campaign. Okay, and thanks very much, ABC's Ann Compton, live for us this morning in Atlanta. Now, as for what the viewers out there thought about who won last night's debate, ABC News and Nightline conducted an instant poll last night just after this debate. Al Gore edged out Dan Quayle. The number is 38% to 35%, very close as you can see. Just 2% gave it to James Stockdale. 17% say they think this debate essentially was a draw. As for the campaign horse race, Clinton picked up a point after last night's debate. He's up to 47% now in presidential preference. Mr. Bush gained three points to stand at 38%, and Ross Perot remains at 12%. Now, the three vice presidential candidates will all be joining us here on Good Morning America this morning, coming right up. Vice President Dan Quayle at 7.30, the Democratic challenger Al Gore, and at 8 o'clock, the independent candidate James Stockdale. One more note now from the campaign trail. The State Department said yesterday that a senior official recently ordered the U.S. embassies in Oslo and London to check Bill Clinton's draft status and citizenship records dating all the way back to the late 1960s. The department said the order was in response to requests from the media for information on Clinton filed under the Freedom of Information Act. Clinton has strongly denied unsubstantiated rumors that he sought to renounce his U.S. citizenship to try to avoid the draft during the Vietnam War. Navy officials have now announced a number of steps trying to stamp out sexual harassment in the service. The Navy will open a toll-free telephone hotline before the end of the year, we're told, for both victims and perpetrators of sexual harassment. Officials will also review the career options open to women to see whether additional assignments for women are now possible. Overseas this morning, the big question in Egypt right now is how was an earthquake that was just moderate by geological standards able to do so much damage? The answer may lie in the ruins of more than 500 buildings that either were destroyed or at least partially damaged in this week's earthquake. ABC's Mark Litke has the story. Hundreds of impoverished Egyptian families remain on the streets this morning, still unable to return to their damaged homes. They are angry that no one has come to help them, and increasingly aware that it was not the earthquake alone that caused this tragedy, but Cairo's notoriously slipshod housing construction. In this amateur video taken at the time of the quake, you can see there was no swath of destruction, just puffs of dust where random structures collapsed like this 14-story building, said to have contained numerous building code violations. This tragedy could not have come at a worse time for Egypt, already struggling to cope with massive debt, unemployment, and the relentless pressure of Islamic fundamentalists, now calling this quake God's punishment for a wicked nation. Hoping to head off anti-government criticism, President Hosni Mubarak broke off a trip to Asia and rushed back to Cairo to visit devastated areas and lay plans for relief operations. Still, resources are stretched dangerously thin, hospitals barely coping with the thousands of casualties. Egypt will need a massive amount of humanitarian aid to recover from this crisis, and eventually, someone in government will have to answer for the poorly constructed buildings which crushed so many people in what experts say was a relatively moderate quake. Mark Litke, ABC News. Cairo. And that is the news till now. It's time to check in with Charlie and Spencer. All right, and here's my good friend, the learned colleague from uh, <laughs> the state of Virginia. Well, that's right. A little comedy on this show after last night, uh, Spencer Christian. <laughs> well, we need a little comedy after last night, don't we? C O M I T Y. I'm talking oh, about. Oh, that. comedy. C -O -M -E -D -Y. I you, oh, I beg your pardon. We need some of that also. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the maps, Charlie. And now some C O M E D Y. Uh, we'll, we have. 
a map that says goodbye summer and hello winter. And the reason for that is that winter is arriving with a fury up in the northern Rockies and northern plains. This area just a week ago had record high temperatures. It was quite warm and summer-like. Today, a high at Butte, Montana will be only 39 degrees, a high at Duluth, Minnesota only 40, and heavy snow is falling around Butte and other places in the northern Rockies. Look for 6 to 12 inches of snow accumulation in some of the areas hardest hit today in the eastern slopes of the northern Rockies and the western portion of the Dakotas. Winds will be gusting up around 30 miles per hour or higher, so it's going to feel quite winter-like. Meanwhile, the rest of the nation looks this way. Mostly sunny skies across the southern tier of states. Nice and warm down here with highs generally in the 80s and some 90s in the southern plains. A little break in the clouds in parts of the upper Mississippi Valley and the eastern Dakotas. There'll be some sunshine there today. It'll be j basically wet and windy over the northeast, especially the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley. And it'll be cold enough to support some light snowfall in the northernmost parts of the Great Lakes and the upper Mississippi Valley. This cold air mass, by the way, in the northwest is going to deepen and take hold over a large area of the west over the next couple of days. And the warm air is going to pretty much disappear, except for the southwest, and push eastward and then northward. That's a look at the national weather picture. Here's a look at the weather where you are. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday. It's going to be a fairly nice day in central Iowa. Temperatures topping out right around 60 degrees in the Des Moines area with a partly sunny sky. One system going to be moving off to the east, taking some rain away from us. Another one off to the west with a little rain and snowfall in it, but we are going to stay dry. Temperatures today, 50s and 60s across the state. For Des Moines, you can expect a partly sunny day with a high around 60. Winds will be from the north, 10 to 20 miles per hour. More on today's contrasting air masses in the next half hour. Joan? All right, thank you very much, Spencer. Right now, 11 minutes after, from the moment last night's vice presidential debate ended, the analysis began from the experts to the voters who watched. Well, this morning, we hear from the players. In our 7.30 half hour, Senator Al Gore joins us. Then in our 8 o'clock half hour, we will talk to independent uh, vice presidential candidate James Stockdale. But joining us right now from Atlanta, Vice President Dan Quayle. Mr. Vice President, good morning. Good morning. Well, we've heard the spin on this whole thing and uh, the fact that the, all the participants, I think, are claiming victory, so I won't even ask you if you thought you won. <laughs> I will, though, start by asking you about your strategy. The polls indicate this morning that the combative, aggressive attack was probably not the best idea. What is your response to that? Well, Joan, uh, I think what the American people saw last night that was B Bill Clinton uh, his program was uh, on the table. His program is to, to raise taxes, to increase spending, to make government bigger. Uh, that's going to cost jobs. And also, more telling than that, uh, last night uh, I brought up a number of times and said that Bill Clinton lacked the character and the integrity to be President of the United States. Uh, Al Gore not once, not once in 90 minutes defended Bill Clinton's integrity. Uh, Bill Clinton does have trouble telling the truth. And never, maybe Bill, Al Gore will do it this morning after he's thought about it or the Clinton campaign has told him to respond to this, but not once last night did he respond to my assertion that Bill Clinton has trouble telling the truth. Well, you most certainly did bring it up a number of times last night. One would might say that you hammered it home. This was a Dan Quayle that we saw, a combative, aggressive Dan Quayle, very different Dan Quayle than we saw debating uh, Lloyd Benson in 1988. <laughs> and I wonder if you didn't go into this um, trying to fight a lot of negativity toward you. Uh, if that didn't play into how you presented yourself. And do you think that you turned those negative thoughts around? Well, I, I, I certainly hope so, and I, I, I think so, but uh, that's uh, for a later day. Uh, the important thing is that we're going to be electing a president in a few weeks. And uh, the question is, uh, who, do, who will the American people vote for? Uh, will they vote for somebody that's going to raise taxes and put uh, people out of work? Is they going to vote for someone that wants to make government bigger? Uh, are they going to vote for somebody that really does have uh, trouble uh, telling the truth? I don't think so. And as I said last night, Joan, this is very important. There's going to be a crisis somewhere. It's going to be an international crisis somewhere in the next four years. And you have to be able to make decisions. You, we, we, the American people want to have a, a president that they can trust. And can they really trust Bill Clinton? Al Gore didn't answer that question last night. The American people will answer it for him. But I was amazed that the vice presidential running mate would not answer the question and would not uh, defend the integrity of Bill Clinton. All right, let me take, go back to something you just mentioned as far as raising taxes, because you made a claim last night that, that the Clinton-Gore economic plan would raise taxes on the middle class. Specifically, you said, uh, quote, everybody making $36,000 a year or more will have their taxes raised. Uh, that is true. Where do you get that figure? 
Well, from their economic plan, they talk about raising uh, taxes $150 billion. They say that they're going to have the tax rate at 36 percent. Uh, if you're going to have the tax rate at 36 percent and raise that kind of money, you're going to have to go down to, to taxing people making $36,000 a year or more. But we pulled that means it, a couple, that, means a a a that means a couple that uh, earns $40,000 is going to be paying another $1,000 in taxes. And this is a big uh, tax increase, the most significant tax increase uh, uh, in our nation's history, and that's if, Bill Clinton's if, economic if you look at plan. It though, um, if you look at that, though, the plan actually proposes a tax cut for middle-income Americans, uh, and that is presuming, I guess, that you did not include other sources of revenue in trying, and it was an <laughs> assumption. Was that not based on an assumption? I, 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 I was going perhaps on an erroneous assumption to go, go, uh, uh, go according to what the economic plan is of Bill Clinton. Now, Bill Clinton uh, will probably uh, deny it. He'll run away from it. Uh, uh, he changed his mind on all sorts of things. I'm sure he'll change his mind on this. Uh, he doesn't, uh, doesn't come clean. But the fact of the matter is, is if you take $150 billion of new taxes, and it's going to be the top tax rate at 36%, you're going to go down to 36,000 uh, people making $36,000 a year more, and they're going to get taxed. Okay, I I'll leave that one because that's how you look at the numbers, uh, to fight that one. However, the, you made another... Um controversial accusation last night and was based on Senator Gore's book which is called Earth and Balance which I have right here. First of all, let's watch. The fact of the matter is is that one of the proposals that Senator Gore has uh, suggested is to have the taxpayers of America uh, spend a hundred billion dollars a year on environmental projects in foreign countries. Just not foreign true. aid it's Senator, it's in, it's in your book on it's page not. 304. No, it is no, there. All right, now I have the book here, and I have it Good. open to page 304. Good. It does talk about $100 billion a year as to what that would be, what that would cost to have that program today. Right. But I do not see here a proposal for $100 billion of our taxpayer money going for this. Well, I, I don't have the book in front of me, but I've read it, and I'll tell you what's on page 304. And it's this. He talks about uh, a, a global plan uh, comparable to the Marshall Plan. He talks in, in there, right, you'll find on 300, page 304, 2% of GNP, Joan. Well, 2% of GNP today is actually over $100 billion. And therefore, Senator Gore is recommending that the taxpayers uh, spend $100 billion in foreign aid on environmental projects. It's right there in his book. Uh, they want to deny it. He denied it uh, the last night. You've got the book. It's right there. And, and you... And you still deduct that it, he is proposing a hundred billion dollars from it's our not taxpayer billion money. Dollars, how much is it? Ask him. If it's not a hundred, is it a hundred and twenty? Is it a hundred ninety? How much is it? Well, he actually I, will I, be with us in the next half hour. We'll ask him as well. And pull, as, pull out to page uh, 304 and read it to we, him. We've got it right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to break for a moment. We're going to come back in just a moment with more with Vice President Dan Quayle when Good Morning America continues. can I get specialized medical care at one location so I don't have to travel all over town? At the Tower Medical Clinic. That's where. Why can't I find a clinic where the specialists and my family physician all agree on the best treatment for me? Because you haven't been to the Tower Medical Clinic. That's why. When can I get personal health care from a physician who won't treat me like a number? Now, at the Tower Medical Clinic. That's when. Call 279-WELL. The night she promised to marry me, I made a promise to myself to give her all the finer things in life. Well, over the years, she's made do with less. But this time, this time she's going to get the very best. Thomasville. With the purchase of selected Thomasville dining rooms, receive four place settings of Lennox, China, and Crystal absolutely free. Offer ends October 22nd. After all, I can't think of a better way to show my appreciation. Now at Newton Furniture. Special savings throughout the gallery. I believe she came to disappear. Others say it was a man. The monk who later speak of her face as radiant with volupte. There is no proper translation. Trust me. I trust only my senses. She embraced him forever. A deluxe parfum. Your gift with any volupte purchase. Now available at Yonkers. You'll be amazed when you try new healthy favorites cheese. Is that a diet cheese? 
bread or eat the wrapper. Craig, healthy favorites is different. It's from Kraft. Sure, it has half the fat of regular cheese and fewer calories, but Kraft makes it taste so rich, so creamy, so delicious. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is good. Did you make one for yourself? Men are so predictable. New healthy favorites from Kraft. It'll be your favorite. Nineteen minutes after, and we're back with Vice President Dan Quayle, who joins us from Atlanta to talk about last night's vice presidential debate. Uh, you know, throughout the debate last night, you continually attacked uh, Governor Clinton for waffling. Now, of course, President Bush has also been attacked for changing his position. Obviously, the more uh, well-known one is breaking his pledge on no new taxes. Uh, what is the difference here? There, there's a huge difference, uh, Joan. When uh, President Bush uh, agreed to the Democratic tax increase, uh, he knew that he was going to uh, suffer politically. He knew that it was a, a political risk, but he was willing to assume a political risk to do what he thought at that time was in the best interest of the country. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, will not assume any political risk. He changes his mind all the time. He changed his mind on education. He changed his mind on term limits. limits. He just just uh, two days ago in Philadelphia, uh, on a radio show, he says uh, he attacks uh, Ross Perot. They ask him uh, after the radio show, why did you attack Ross Perot? He says, well, I didn't do any such thing. I mean, Bill Clinton just has trouble telling the truth. There's a difference uh, of, of doing something and changing your mind what's for the best interest of the country. And in Bill Clinton's case, he changed his mind for what's in his own personal best interest. Well, one's called courage and one's called expediency. Well, well, let me ask you something. On the abortion question last night, you very specifically said you were pro-life, and yet on a Larry King program, you said you would support your daughter's decision, her right to choose. I, Is I, that not I, flopping? I, no, it's not at all. Uh, I am pro-life, and I've been very consistent on the abortion issue, and I think it's just, I just didn't leave my daughter out of this, if you don't mind. Well, but the issue is whether or not you stand by one choice. I stand... I, I, I have a pro-life uh, position. Uh, I would obviously support my daughter. Senator Gore also challenged uh, the president's assertion that Russia's SS-18 intercontinental missiles have been eliminated. Uh, that a treaty the between never, the... Go ahead. The president, president say that, Joan. Uh, the president uh, said that he does have a commitment from uh, President Yeltsin. We do have a commitment to, to eliminate uh, the SS-18s. Uh, I was a little surprised that the Senator Gore brought that up. What does he say? That, that it's a bad uh, commitment that we don't want the SS-18s eliminated? Of course we do. It's an, a historic achievement. And President Bush uh, negotiated this uh, with uh, Boris Yeltsin, and you're going to see the SS-18 uh, nuclear uh, ballistic missiles eliminated. Uh, they're targeted on the United States, and it's a great achievement for the President. Going into the debate, the polls predicted that only 19 percent said you could win, 61 percent <laughs> said Senator Gore could win. Do you feel you won? Uh, well, it just shows that the media had not uh, accurately portrayed me over these last four years. I had my opportunity last night, and I feel very good about it. Why do you think that is, that after over four years that that didn't turn around? Well, I think you'd have to ask uh, yourselves that. Uh, why, why have the media treated me the way that they have? I don't know. You ask yourselves that. All right. Vice President Dan Coyle, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It is 22 minutes after still ahead. The other participants from last night's vice presidential debate have their say. I am the only farmer in the United States Senate. Chuck Grassley, he knows farming is more than just a way of life. It's the backbone of Iowa's economy. That's why he's been fighting to expand ethanol production. And on October 1st, Chuck Grassley won when President Bush announced changes to increase ethanol consumption. The result, more jobs and money for Iowa. That's good for Iowa and America. My first job and first duty is to the people of Iowa. Chuck Grassley, working hard like Iowa. The ultimate sale is hard to find. Not this week at Pigeons. You'll find the ultimate selection, the ultimate service, the ultimate savings. $3.99 sofas, $2.49 recliners, $5.99 satellites, bedding $49, $6.99 carpeting, and this nostalgic oak dining room for only $4.99. Plus no payments, no finance charges till May. Hurry, it's the sale to end all sales. The ultimate sale at Pigeons, the ultimate home furnishing store. America's hopping to the great light taste of Wells Blue Bunny. Trimming down. And moving lighter on their feet. 
Bunny. Wells Blue Bunny has so many great light tastes to choose from. We take out fat and calories, but leave in all the delicious flavor that'll set your taste buds dancing. So lighten up. Hop on over to the best light taste in America. Wells Blue Bunny, the flavor of the heartland, because it tastes so good. You know what tastes better on Grant's Farm Bread? Toast tastes better, jam is nicer. Everything tastes better on Grant's Farm Bread. Bread tastes livelier, pickles are crunchier. Everything tastes better on Grant's Farm Bread. And why? Because Grant's Farm tastes so good all by itself. And it's cholesterol free. Beef is tastier, peppers are snappier. Everything tastes better on Grant's Farm Bread. Everything tastes better on Grant's Farm Bread. Taste them. This is a Channel 5 News Update. Good morning, everyone. 725 right now. I'm Renee Starzik. Last night's vice presidential debate, quite a show. Dan Quayle and Al Gore came out swinging, while running mate, Perot running mate James Stockdale seemed to have trouble keeping up. Both the Democratic and the Republican Party say their candidate was the winner. What do Iowans think? Alan Erlis watched the debate with a group of Drake students and has their reaction. National security. No studying tonight. Debate watching was this group of college students' top priority. What the future holds for them depends on what they and other voters decide next month. They represented a wide cross-section of voters, Democrat and Republican, Perot and Undecided. Some were searching for answers, others looking for reinforcement for their beliefs. They debated the debate while it happened. They cheered and they laughed. Democrats thought Senator Gore won. Republicans gave the victory to Quayle. I think um, Quayle did such a great showing and like better than what he was expected maybe by the American public. I believe Senator Gore presented Governor Clinton's plan superbly and handled the rebuttals that deserved to be handled. Perot supporters were visibly embarrassed when James Stockdale, Ross Perot's running mate, spoke. But all agreed on one thing, their disappointment with the debate. I think but the purpose of a debate is to inform people, and this, this didn't serve as very informative. But everything was about context, they were manipulating the, uh, the words and this and that, and I don't think that the average person who hasn't been involved or researched both sides would know. For the undecided voter, the debate didn't help them make a decision. It leaves everybody still undecided. There were no, okay, well, gee, someone was the winner, I'm going to go to him. I mean, if you're undecided, you're probably still undecided. I thought maybe some of these debates would help me decide on who I might choose, but it didn't at all. Alan Erlis, Channel 5 News. Two Polk County men are behind bars this morning, charged with faking a burglary at a local body shop. 27-year-old Kelly Faust allegedly staged a break-in at his own body shop so he could cash in on an insurance policy. Police say 21-year-old Randy Rice was also in on the scam. Authorities believe the two used the insurance money they collected to buy this trailer. Inside it, police found a number of tools that Faust claimed were stolen. He's now facing a felony charge for fraud. It's getting to be that time of year again when noses run and muscles ache. The flu season won't be here until early December, but if you want to avoid the sick bed, now's the time to get your flu shot. Professionals say it can take about two and a half weeks for that shot to kick in. Now, anyone can get the vaccine, but doctors say it's the elderly and chronically ill who really need them. You can get your flu shots at the Carpenter Senior Center or call the Polk County Health Department at 286-3798. The shots are free, but donations are accepted. Well, Dave's here right now, and it looks like we're in for another nice day. Not bad, but it is going to turn cold. I'll we'll have your full five guests coming up right after the break. It's Iowa's Powerball. Play now for your chance to catch the multi-multi-million dollar power of Powerball. Temperatures this morning in the mid-40s across the central part of the state. 46 degrees in Des Moines under a mostly cloudy sky. Ames is partly cloudy and 42 degrees. Winds are from the north, 12 miles per hour. The dew point comfortable at 39 and the pressure rising 29.80 inches. For today, we're going to have a partly sunny day around here. We're going to be on the north side of the front, so some clouds mixed in 
with the sunshine. Some showers activity off to our west, but we're going to stay dry. Temperatures, though, because we're on the north side of the front, going to be in the 50s for most of the state with some 60s maybe in the southeast part of the state. Your five cast for Des Moines and surrounding area. Today, partly sunny, a high around 60 degrees, a little breezy as well. North winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. And for tonight, partly cloudy, 38 for the low winds, will, or excuse me, clouds will start to be increasing towards morning. And for tomorrow, mostly cloudy, a chance of showers in the afternoon, a high around 55 degrees. And rest of the outlook, not good, 40s, Friday, Saturday.